Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar about simulated free field measurements, or how to measure a speaker without an anechoic chamber. This is based on a 1994 AES paper that I did with Chris Druck at Bruin Care, and I give special credit to Chris for turning our very old slide transparencies into PowerPoint. Before I get started, I would like to introduce SNV Samford, our exclusive distributor in China, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. They were founded in 1996 and are experts in sound and vibration. So thanks for joining us today. My name is Steve Temme, the president of Listen. So I have um, been talking to industry colleagues these past few months. One of the greatest challenges I have been hearing about is not having access to labs and their anechoic chambers. I've heard of people trying to make measurements in their yards and suspending loudspeakers on a zip line to obtain free field measurements. So today I'm going to talk about a technique that enables you to make free field measurements in an ordinary room. You don't need any special equipment beyond your regular audio test system. If you're using Soundcheck, we offer a free test sequence that takes care of all the complicated math involved so you can just load up the sequence and start making measurements. If you're not using Soundcheck, you can still use this technique, but it's going to require a lot of programming on your part. What this test sequence essentially does is it makes a near field measurement and a time window far field measurement and then splices them together to cover the entire frequency range. This is based on a technique that I developed along with Chris Druck when we were back at Rural and Care in 1994. We actually presented this uh, AES paper on the subject and in the journal. You can download that from our website if you want to get deeper into the math. It has actually been possible to make this measurement in Soundcheck since 2001 when we introduced time windowed measurements. However, it is one of those little known features that is not particularly widely used. We have recently updated the sequence to include ported loudspeakers. So the agenda for today is first I'm going to discuss sound paths and reflections and explain the mathematics and acoustic principles behind simulated tree field measurement techniques. I'm going to talk about the test setup that can be used to measure this. I'm going to demonstrate our splice sequence and measurements and sound check. And last but not least, I'm going to talk about correlation of results made in an anechoic chamber and manufacturer's published data. So for starters, if we want to compare loudspeakers, we typically want to measure only the direct sound and eliminate the room influence, including reflections and background noises. In practice, this may be difficult to achieve without a specially treated room or special signal processing. In an ordinary room, there are reflections which have a longer signal path than direct sound. Therefore, they arrive attenuated later in time and correlated to the direct sound. There are also uncorrelated noises such as fans, people talking, and other background noises. These can be mitigated with proper choice of test techniques. So if we have a reflection that is 10 dB below the direct sound, this can cause significant peaks and dips in the loudspeaker's frequency response because it is correlated in phase with the direct sound. This will result in errors of plus 2.39 dB to minus 3.3 dB, and generally is unacceptable for um, comparing results in different rooms. So if we want a uh, small measurement error of plus or minus 0.5 dB or less, with uncorrelated noise, we need to be at least 10 dB below the uh, direct signal or desired signal. And for reflections, which are correlated, we need to be at least 25 dB below the direct sound. So this is not that easy to do. So what are the free field methods that can be used to isolate the direct from the reflected sound? I'm going to talk about anechoic rooms, outdoor measurements, ground plane measurements, near field measurements, and time selected te techniques. And I'll discuss the trade-offs as well. So the first and obvious method is to use an, uh, an anechoic chamber with sound-absorbing wedges that turn reflections into heat. 
The minimum dimension of the chamber determines the lowest frequency that can be measured without reflections. In this example, to measure down to 100 hertz requires a chamber with a minimum dimension greater than 17 feet. To go down to 20 hertz would require a chamber that is over 84 feet tall and has wedges over 14 feet long. That would be really expensive. So a less expensive alternative is to measure outdoors, weather permitting, of course. In order to attenuate the signal, single reflection from the ground at least 25 dB, the speaker needs to be at least 29 feet above the ground. In this photo, the speaker is only 10 feet above the ground and is not adequate. So another method is called a ground plane, a ground plane measurement and it is another inexpensive alternative to an anechoic chamber if a large flat surface is available, such as a parking lot. Again, weather permitting. Ground, the ground plane acts as an image source or mirror and theoretically doubles the level by 6 dB compared to a free field measurement because it appears as, as if there are two identical loudspeakers. This works well for simulating floor standing or stack pro audio loudspeakers but creates high frequency reflections and boosts the mid frequency base due to the doubling of the cabinet size when compared to a single speaker mounted on a speaker stand in an anechoic chamber. A good alternative to limit the influence of room reflections at low frequencies is to place the microphone in the near field of the driver. The direct sound level becomes orders of magnitude higher greater than 25 dB than any reflection or background noise. Therefore, only the direct sound gets measured. Don Keel wrote an AS paper back in 1974 explaining this technique and how it was possible to calculate the far field response from the near field response at low frequencies. This breaks down at higher frequencies when the wavelength becomes smaller and the loudspeaker becomes directional. This near field technique can also be used on ports and passive radiators. The driver and ports are measured separately and then scaled according to their effective radiating area. And finally, the complex power sum to yield the overall near field response. This is done both in magnitude and phase. Here is an example of an individual near field response for a ported loudspeaker, both at the driver in the near field of the port. Responses are complex, both in magnitude and phase, although only the magnitude is shown here. The port response is scaled to the driver response based on the ratio of their effective radii prior to complex summation. So consequently, we get the complex summed overall near field response for the ported system, scaled to the far field response at one meter. Now we can talk about the sound pressure level at the microphone position as if it were at one meter. So the near field is good at measuring low frequencies, but not at measuring high frequencies. So in order to do that, we need to move the microphone into the far field, typically one meter away from the loudspeaker. But the direct sound from the loudspeaker arrives first at the microphone, followed by the reflections. By applying a time window, to the direct sound only, the reflections can be removed. To maximize the size of the direct sound time window, we center the loudspeaker and the microphone in the room. Again, like an anechoic chamber, the lowest frequency can be measured is determined by the room size, but without any special or expensive treatment. Here is an example measurement of a loudspeaker in an ordinary room with reflections and noise. I have chosen to display the time response magnitude to make it easier to see the reflections. To apply a time window, it is a good idea to have some leading and trailing cosine tapers to minimize ringing in the frequency domain. The 2K window is the window of choice with 10% tapers. So the next, in the time domain, we take the direct sound and we delay it so that we can position the direct sound to, 
time zero. It is convenient to remove the direct sound delay so that the reflections indicate the difference from the direct sound. Then a rectangular time window with half cosine tapers, the dashed lines, is applied. After applying the time windowed impulse response, the frequency response is recalculated without any reflections. Due to the uncertainty principle, the frequency resolution is reduced by one over the time window. In this example, a three millisecond time window results in a 333 hertz frequency resolution. So the frequency response is not valid below 333 hertz. So is it possible by taking the near field low frequency response and splicing it to the time windowed high frequency far field response to get an overall wideband response? The answer is yes, with some careful post-processing of the data. And these are the steps I'm going to take you through, which include an overlap region, a delay compensation, and a level offset between the far field and the near field, and then presenting the data in its final format. So first, the near field response must be level and delay compensated due to different microphone positions. Second, a transition or splice frequency needs to be chosen that is valid for both the near field and the far field measurements. Once the responses are compensated, there should be an overlap region where both curves look similar. If the speaker is too big and the room too small, there may be no overlap region where the time windowed far field measurement does not extend low enough in frequency due to the size of the loudspeaker enclosure and the size of the room. Once the transition frequency is selected, a frequency window is applied below for the near field measurement and above for the far field measurement. Then the two curves are spliced together at the transition frequency, both in magnitude and phase. So what we get is a full range response. In this example, it's for a two-way five inch closed box loudspeaker and we see the final magnitude in dBSPL for one watt at one meter. We also get a corresponding phase and group delay responses. And last but not least, we get the full bandwidth impulse response, both in magnitude, otherwise known as the energy time curve, and we can also get it as the impulse response real and imaginary. Now this can be used in Listen's sound map for time frequency analysis such as waterfall plots or exported to MATLAB for further analysis. So comparison of the splice simulated free field response to the response measured in an anechoic chamber is shown. Note the undulations in the response measured in the anechoic chamber due to insufficiently suppressed low frequency reflections. This particular chamber is good down to 80 hertz, but what we forget is that we also get ripple of 80 hertz through the entire frequency range, and you can actually see near resonance is a little bit of an 80 hertz dip. We can also look at the phase comparison of the simulated free field measurement to the anechoic chamber, and again, we can see some of these low frequency anomalies. So I want to demonstrate to you how we can make these measurements in practice. What is the equipment that's needed in order to perform the splice sequence, which I'm going to demonstrate to you in a moment. So we are using today an Audio Connect audio interface, which is both a uh, A to D and DA converter, along with a microphone power supply for the SCM measurement microphone. That is going to be driving the SC amp, um, which is going to be driving the loudspeaker under test. Okay, now I'd like to demonstrate the splice sequence inside a sound check. And I've opened up the uh, sequence editor so you can see all the steps as I run through it. I have divided this sequence up into near field and far field subsequences, and then a master sequence to actually combine the two together. So let's just run through it and I'll explain it step by step. So the first question is a message step. Is the speaker ported or not? Well, the speaker I'm using today is ported. 
It's a simple port. And then it asks me quite conveniently if I want to recall previous stored data. So I could actually just make my measurements, go back to my office, and then do everything in post-processing. That's one of the beauties of SoundCheck is it actually records the entire recorded waveform and lets you post-process it later as well as listen to it. But I'm going to make a live measurement, so I'll just say no. Now it's going to ask me to place the microphone in the near field of the woofer. And as soon as I've done that, I'll just go over quickly and make sure the microphone's in the right place. And I'm all set, so I just hit enter. So we're performing a step sign sweep in 12th octave from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And there's the time waveform below. Now, since I have a ported loudspeaker, I need to move the microphone to the near field of the port. Now that I've done that, I just hit enter. Now we repeat the measurement, 12th octave step sign, 20 to 20 kilohertz in the near field of the port. This is the same procedure as I showed you in the previous PowerPoint presentation. So now I need to adjust the surface area of the port to the surface area of the woofer. So I can just enter the surface area of the woofer first, then of the port. And again, if it were two ports, I could just double it. And now it actually summates, sums the two, uh, both in magnitude and phase. And the yellow curve is actually the two combined. So I could save this to disk if I want, but I've already done that. So I'll just say no. And now it's going to bring up the simulated far field measurement. And again, I can just recall the data from disk, or I can make a live measurement. So I'm going to just say no. And now it's going to tell me to position the microphone in the far field, and then hit enter when I'm ready to measure. So I'm going to go over and do that. And traditionally, I want to point the microphone at the center of the speaker. That's all set. I'm going to hit enter. Now we're doing a continuous sine sweep, otherwise known as the Farina sweep, from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And we can see that we do indeed have uh, reflections. In fact, if I go in here and just zoom in a little, I can just use a cursor. We'll see that there are quite a few reflections. And it's a little hard to see on the real impulse response. This is why I showed in the PowerPoint presentation to use the uh, energy time curve. But anyhow, I have some reflections out here and some at lower um, time intervals here. So I can either just let Soundcheck find the first reflection, or I can enter my own. And I think today I'll just enter my own. And I'm going to use five milliseconds, because I saw one around six milliseconds. And now it's going to time window the response. And I do have a little bit of a reflection. I could go back and change it if I want. But I'm just going to say that's good enough for now. And now it's going to want to combine the two near field and far field measurements together at a given frequency. So I can see that in the region of maybe 250, 300 hertz, that it looks like a good starting point. In fact, let's choose um, 200 hertz. And I can always go back and change this if I want. So now you can see that they overlap pretty well from 200 to 300 hertz. And if this frequency is good, and you can see in phase, they also overlap 
around 200 hertz very nicely. I just say yes. And now sound check goes through all the post-processing steps to calculate the impulse response from 20 to 20 kilohertz and the frequency response from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And again, I can save this information to disk. Now the beauty of this is I can also look at the phase if I want and unwrapped phase and so on and so forth. I can also take the impulse response into sound map and actually look at a waterfall plot. And I can do a lot of other things like export it to MATLAB and use it in other um, DSP programs. So I want to show you some of the steps involved in doing the splice using the post-processing editor. So the first one I'm going to perform is after I've done the near field to far field level correction that I showed you earlier in the first sequence, I now want to frequency window the near field below the splice frequency. So in this case, I use a feature in Soundcheck called read from memory list, where it's actually going to read in the selected splice frequency that I entered of 200 hertz and create a frequency window in the near field from 20 to 200 hertz. Likewise, I'm going to do this for the far field where I want a frequency window from 200 hertz up to 20 kilohertz. So this will pop up for a second. It might take a second to update. Well, actually, um, just to point out, I can go all the way up to 40 kilohertz, whatever frequency I want. But now it's taking 200 hertz or 201 because I don't want them to overlap and frequency one doing up to 40 kilohertz. And then, of course, once I have those two curves, I can merely just stitch them together, splice them together. And that is done with an arithmetic step where I literally just go in and say, take the near field, operand A, plus the far field, operand B, and just add them together and combine the uh, frequency resolution of both curves. And as I mentioned earlier, I did a 1 12th octave near field um, measurement. And for the far field, I actually use a Farina sweep, continuous log sweep. So they're actually different resolutions. So the next step is to actually go in and convert them to the same uh, frequency format. I tend to like to use uh, 24th octave. So I've used ISO R40. You can choose whatever you want. And then I also want to calculate the impulse response where I have to do an inverse FFT to get back to the time domain. So that is this one here, another post-processing step. And again, Soundcheck has a lot of post-processing capability. So here I'm going for my frequency response. Remember, it's complex magnitude and phase. Therefore, if I do an inverse FFT, I can go back to the time domain and calculate the wideband impulse response. And then basically that's it. I just have to decide whether I want to save the data. So I have some message steps that you saw prompting me whether I want to save it or not. And as I also mentioned, you can then go to the offline mode, such as sound map, and actually look at the uh, impulse response in the time frequency domain. So what I do in sound map, is I go find my impulse response, which is near field and far field combined. Then I zoom in over the impulse response and say, I don't really need to look at what happens before the, the beginning, before the impulse response. I come down here and I can look at a variety of things, but for cumulative spectral decay, which is a waterfall plot, I'll just choose that, hit analyze. It quickly calculates the uh, cumulative spectral decay versus time. And I can either look at it as a time frequency map, contour map. I can look at things such as uh, the spectrum at different frequencies, including group delay. And of course, I can also look at different slices in time. But what most people like to see is the 3D waterfall plot. So to see that, I just click on the 3D button. It takes a second to 
draw all the different frequencies versus time. Once I have that, I can actually drag the uh, plot around to look at particular frequencies. For example, this speaker is actually quite good in that it decays very quickly through most of the frequency range. A little bit of ringing at low frequencies and a little bit of ringing at the highest frequencies. In fact, the, uh, the tweeter on the speaker has got a hard dome, so it has a bit of a resonance up around uh, 25 kilohertz. And if I want to, I can go and zoom in or look at things in different ways. But basically, this gives me something that we normally can't view with uh, simulated free field measurements because they only go down to a couple of hundred hertz. So now I expect you're wondering how close these measurements come to an anechoic chamber. I don't have an anechoic chamber here, but our friends at Indy Acoustics measured the same speaker in both their chamber and out in their lab. We compared the results and also compared them to the manufacturer's data sheet. So here's the speaker set up in their anechoic chamber. You can see that is a quite small chamber, approximately 3 meters by 3.7 by 2.6 meters. And this will be important when we look at the results. In the chamber, we made a standard frequency response measurement using a conventional 12th octave step sign sweep to show the true anechoic response. The speaker was suspended in the chamber, and the half-inch free-field microphone was positioned at one meter on axis. Next, the same speaker was measured out in the lab. As you can see, this is just a regular room with hard walls and floors and lots of potential for reflections. First, the near-field measurement was made next to the driver. Second, the near-field measurement made next to the port. Now in this case, it's a two-port loudspeaker, but they are identical. So if we just measure one and add the other, we will not need to measure both independently. Finally, a far-field measurement was made at one meter. And then we actually let the sound check splice sequence do its work and splice together. Um, and this is what we got. The green line on the graph is the near field, far field spliced response. The blue curve is what was measured in the anechoic chamber. You can see that at above 100 hertz, they very closely correspond with each other. Below 100, 120 hertz, though, we see quite different results. And this is to be expected because the cutoff frequency of the anechoic chamber is about 120 hertz. So this actually raises the interesting issue that this method is actually more accurate than measuring in a chamber because you don't have to worry about the low frequency limitations of the, and size of the chamber or room. So finally, we compared our spliced simulated free field measurement in green to the manufacturer's specification in black by overlaying the published curve onto the measurements. Here, a much closer correlation in the low frequencies is observed. This is likely because the manufacturer's measurements were made in a much larger chamber with a lower cutoff frequency, and therefore closer to the true anechoic response. However, we can still see there are some bumps due to reflections in the chamber. At higher frequencies, you can see the curves are very close and essentially the same shape. The slight variations can be attributed to the microphone positioning and or differences in the drivers. It is expected that if the exact same position used as in the manufacturer's specification had been replicated, identical results would have been obtained. So there you have it. We believe this method offers an excellent or even better alternative to an anechoic chamber measurement and is particularly valuable for those working at home without access to a chamber. We can also make directional measurements just by placing the microphone at different angles off axis. A turntable makes this fast and easy to automate. And once we've collected the data, we can actually show both the horizontal and vertical polar plots, as well as the directivity index for both vertical and horizontal. OK, in summary, 
Splicing a time-windowed high-frequency measurement with a low-frequency near-field measurement provides an accurate free-field measurement including impulse response over the loudspeaker's entire frequency range. This method overcomes the challenges of other methods. For example, outdoor measurements are impractical. Ground plane measurements only work well for floor standing or stacked loudspeaker arrays. This method can also be used for directivity measurements, and there's just a couple things to be aware of. Whether measuring in a chamber or in a room, the size of the measurement room, including an anechoic chamber, determines the low frequency cutoff when measured in the far field. Measurements in the near field are accurate up to frequencies where the wavelength approaches the size of the loudspeaker. Okay, and now for the wrap up, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And special thanks to our colleagues at SNV in China for hosting today's webinar. Please fill out our survey to get a download link to our video recording. The survey link is shown in the chat window. And now I will answer any questions live from the chat window. So the floor is open to Q&A. Thanks again for joining us.